Hi everyone and welcome to Play in the Spaces to another poetry video. Today we're talking about Giuseppe by Roderick Ford, another poem on the NXL A-level English Literature curriculum. With that, let's dive straight into the summary and the line-by-line -line analysis. The poem is written as a conversation between the speaker and his uncle, and the speaker hears his uncle tell him a very frightening story. The uncle watched some of the men in Sicily, where this poem is set, kill a mermaid, a live mermaid, and it's implied that although the action was justified because it was during the Second World War and the troops were starving and they made all sorts of excuses, the actions weren't morally right, and the speaker thanks God that Giuseppe feels guilty because these actions should never be justified. The poem explores themes of transgression, conflict, power, morality, and perhaps even gender roles. And I think it could best be compared to The Lama's Hireling or A Minor Role, poems that will come up later on in the playlist, partly because it also explores the theme of difference. And I think it could be a little autobiographical in its nature because the poet is on the spectrum, so of course he experiences being different and how people treat those who are different. A quick note about the structure. The poem is written in free verse and the lack of specific rhythm or rhyme, the lack of a rigid structure gives it the feel of an oral story. It also reflects that it's somewhat carefree, much like the actions of the people in the story. Though laden with guilt, they focused on the present rather than the future. However, the simplistic writing of the poem, the lack of metaphors or similes, or difficult to understand language and imagery makes Giuseppe feel like a confession and makes the reader feel close to the poem, allowing us to feel the emotions deeper. My uncle Giuseppe told me that in Sicily, in World War II, in the courtyard behind the aquarium, where the Bergenvillia grew so well, the only captive mermaid in the world was butchered on the dry and dusty ground by a doctor, a fishmonger, and certain others. So the first stanza sets the scene. It's in beautiful Sicily. And of course we have these associations of the sunny weather and the pretty flowers, just to realize that this is not going to be a cheerful story. It's set during the Second World War. It prepares us somewhat for the atrocities being committed, and we begin to expect a sad, but ordinary, ordinary for the war, story of death, of destruction, and then we realize that it's not quite so ordinary. It's not ordinary in the slightest because we have the last captive mermaid. More than that, she's the last captive mermaid because she's the only mermaid that was caught and the only one that was kept. Essentially, she's the voiceless victim that cannot escape and she's already stuck in this situation and of course she's going to be the one that's sacrificed first. She is something special. She's the last spark, the last hope, perhaps the last kindness or the last piece of magic that humanity has but because she's voiceless and because she's a woman and because she's captive and different and already not treated as a full member of society, she's the first to go. She's butchered. She's not even killed. She's not shown respect. She's treated like an animal. That's how they justify the killing. She's a fish. She deserves to die. If not for Giuseppe, her story would never be told because people don't want to reckon with the past. And we also see just how far from squeaky clean history is. Everyone has a role and everyone contributed to it being the dark and dirty and bloody story that we, t that we tell today. Everyone contributed, the doctor, the fishmonger, others, they all saw her being butchered on the dry, dusty ground. It's dry and dusty as a contrast to her like wetness because she's a fish and aliveness. So essentially they're burying her and they're burying this aliveness in favor of death much like war kills many millions of human lives. The ground being dusty could also be a metaphor for moral dryness. Morality is thrown out of the window in favor of hunger, in favor of justifying hunger. And all of the top respectable people in society, like doctors, the well-educated ones, who should be at the forefront, who should be arguing with reason that no, this is not right, they're right there participating, participating with the brutal murder of an innocent being and history lets them go. They're never held accountable for their actions. And the endowment of in the world was butchered also shows the chaos and the confusion and the separation that led to this decision. The world was fractured by the Second World War and by the atrocities that kept, that were essentially just a constant stream of never-ending pain and abuse. And this is what led people to throw away their morality and to throw away their 
feeling of being human and respecting other people. This is what led to this murder. She, it, had never learned to speak because she was simple, or so they said. But the priest who held one of her hands while her throat was cut said she was only a fish and fish can't speak. But she screamed like a woman in terrible fear. So the men in the poem, because of course the murder is being committed by men and this is how we explore gender roles as well, the men try to justify this action. But the truth comes out because whether you like it or not, they can't lie to themselves and say that she is just a fish because it's clear that she's not. She is separated by a sejura, she, comma, it. This very much emphasizes the excuse mechanisms that they try to put in place to reconcile their mind with the action that they're committing. And in mythology, mermaids typically have beautiful voices, but this one doesn't. She's speechless. And it's shown that she's different even here. And this, this, this difference is turned into a weapon. Nobody wants to think that maybe it's because she's gentle or she's innocent or she's this soft, soft being that truly believes that these people won't hurt her. No, instead this is how we say she's a fish. And even those figures who we view as figures of moral righteousness like priests, they're right there holding her down because the hunger makes them so. The hunger strips away their human values and of course now we're left to question who's the real animal here? Is it the half fish or is it the people who who murder someone in cold blood just because they can't help and handle an empty stomach. And notice the use of the connective but, the contradiction. Giuseppe knows full well that she's not quite a fish, she's not quite what they make her out to be, but he squashes it down. And likewise, religion that we so often appeal to is criticized in the stanza as well, because religion that should be there telling us that no, remember your values, falls away as soon as we start thinking of our own basic needs, as soon as we realize that we're self selfish creatures who only care about our own interests. The line, she screamed like a woman, it shows that they only realized the horror once the deed was already done. And it's the only simile in the entire poem, and this very much emphasizes that she's more of a woman than a fish. Terrible fear, it's not just fear, it's terrible fear. It emphasizes just how desperate the situation is, and it shows how, how quickly we rise to the occasion of killing our every value just for keeping ourselves sated and hungry and satisfied, sated, not hungry, satisfied, happy. Because the mermaid essentially acts as a symbol of our last hope and our last humanity. And this innocence that is so quickly killed off, it shows very much the trade-off that people take when they embark on to war. And when they took a ripe gold roll from her side, the doctor said, this was proof. She was just a fish. And anyway, an egg is not a child, but refused when some was offered to him. Just when we think that this is it, the atrocity has been committed, the next stanza moves on to guilt or showing how nobody's punished through their actions, we have and. Giuseppe has to take a breath before he gets to the next part because not only have they killed an innocent person, not only have they committed the sin, but they also killed a child. If killing the mermaid was justified, was killing a pregnant mermaid justified? We start to unearth all of these layers and we see that a simple, a simple action is never so simple. It was a ripe gold roll. The child was almost born. She was probably on her ninth month if it was like ripe and it's described as ripe. And it's also described as gold because it's precious, it's a precious life that they killed because they couldn't deal with the situation that they were dealt with in life. And the doctor knows this perfectly well. And doctors take this oath to not hurt people, to never harm. And the doctor realizes full well that what he just did, that was far from what he promised to do, far from what he went in and from why he became a doctor. But he throws it all away because he thinks of the troops that need nutrition and he decides that ultimately their life is worth more than hers. Then they put her head in her hands in a box for burial. And someone tried to take her wedding ring but the other stopped him and the ring stayed put. So after some time passes they realize that she actually deserved burial, that she wasn't just a fish and this action of the doctors, like the burial, still lives in Giuseppe's mind years later because he realizes 
already back then they knew that it was wrong and yet we continued and yet I continued this cover up. This is what prompted him years later to, to have this confession in front of the speaker. And when, they, when it comes to burying her, they separate her hands and they separate her head. They separate her fish's body because that's, that's what they're going to eat and it seems that they're going to eat her top half as well. But the hands, because the hands are an emotional connection and they have her wedding ring and the, hat, and the head with the face, that's what they choose to put in a box. And we see the enjambment from the hands and the head and the box and we see very visually this separation. And we also hear it audibly because the speaker can't help but take a breath knowing that this is it, this is the finality. Instead of giving her a coffin and giving her luxury, they're putting her in a simple box and they're hiding her in the ground, hoping that their sins never get discovered. And as a last gesture, someone tries to take her wedding ring. Even now, even now when they're treating her as somewhat of a human, somebody still tries to take her wedding ring because for them, she's still different. She's a victim and desperate times call for desperate measures, right? The ring can be sold, the money can be used for me and my family. They only have their own self-interest in mind, but the others stop them. The others retain this inch of humanity to say, oh look, she was married. And this is her last possession, this is her last burial, this is her last reminder of a normal life with her husband before captivity. And it's very sad that it's exactly the similarity that they notice, the similarity to human women that allows them to let her keep the wedding ring. Because if she was just like another mermaid, if she was just like another fish, they would unceremoniously take it. Once people see that you're different, that's when they're willing to justify these acts of transgression, these acts that shouldn't be there. They rest they, the rest they cooked and fed to the troops. They said a large fish had been found on the beach. As much as they tried to justify this atrocity for the troops, for the other men, they know that they're to blame and they know that this guilt of murder is theirs to carry forever. They don't want to, they don't want to involve the troops. And I think they also can't handle the idea that if they told them what they would do, the troops would voice their disapproval. Because it's easy to judge from the outside. They would say, oh, it's so easy for you, we did this for you. But ultimately, they're the ones who did it and they don't want to have the troops wasted because then it's like, what was even the point of carrying out this brutal act? And so they don't tell them. And of course, this raises the question, have the troops realized because they're starving, they're on the beach and suddenly we have this large fish? Excuse the pun, but something is pretty fishy here. Maybe the troops do question it, but by this point, does it even matter? The poet poses very important questions of, very important ethical questions of collective responsibility. It was done for the troops, but they played no part, so are they to blame? Does it even matter if they're to blame, if they're not the ones doing the killing? Why should they take responsibility for the actions of others, even if those actions were for their own good? And these two lines are separated from other stanzas, almost as if it's an afterthought to throw in this detail, because ultimately it's irrelevant. Of course, these ethical questions are important, but when it comes down to the finishing touch, these are the facts. A woman has been butchered. Starvation forgives men many things, my uncle, the aquarium keeper, said, but couldn't look me in the eye, for which I thank God. So Giuseppe's guilt is once again highlighted because he can't look the speaker into the eye. And now he's reduced to just the aquarium keeper, just the label. It shows very much the, different, the distance that the speaker now feels from his uncle because He's no longer a figure of respect in his eyes. I mean, how do you even look at someone after they tell you what they've done? And the speaker and Giuseppe, they both perfectly know that Giuseppe is complicit, whether he likes it or not, because he is the aquarium keeper. He is the one who should have watched the mermaid, who should have looked after her. And yet, as soon as starvation came, he threw her out of the window. And yes, they say that starvation justifies many things and in times of war, in times of war, a state enters an act of war and citizens behave differently, but that doesn't erase the fact that a horrible act has been committed and it haunts him years later still because of how horrible it was. And at the end, we also have some criticism, some more criticism of religion because the speaker brings in God. Thank God. He still, he still has the humanity to recognize his wrong and not look, in, not look him in the eye. 
And I think this is very much a critique of confession because what is the point of coming to coming to Father and saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned and laying out all the horrible, brutal acts that you've committed in your life and expect the Father to say what? Good job for telling me? Good job for clearing out the sin? Ultimately, it does not matter to the mermaid and it does not matter to the mermaid's family how much you repent because the deed has been done. And this confession is essentially just another selfish act to lift the burden of yourself because you know that you can no longer lift the burden off of the victim. What separates us from animals? Is it this last tiny little bit of guilt? Is it that we actually feel guilt for hurting other living beings? Should Giuseppe and the others be punished for doing what they had to do? And what role does religion play in this? Can it justify what they did? Can this act of confession wipe out the blood that they have on their hands? And I think this also acts as a criticism of using religion to justify anything. Because if you can use religion and your own beliefs and values, saying, I believe in God and I believe that this is right because we're choosing the good of the many over the good of the few, what stops you from using your own values to justify other sin? And with that thought-provoking note, I'll leave you to it. So thank you so much for watching the video and I hope this analysis was helpful. Do leave a comment. I always enjoy reading them and see you next time.